So I think Jeff's just blown us all away with the amazing research coming out of the center on larval dispersal. And what I'm going to talk about is how we might be able to use some of that information in conservation planning and the design of marine reserve networks. So with apologies to Alistair, static marine reserves still form the backbone of biodiversity conservation and fisheries management strategies worldwide. And the last few decades have seen a push to establish more and more marine reserves and reserve networks. And that shifting emphasis towards establishing networks of marine reserves is based on the understanding that by situating reserves within a network, we expect that there will be synergistic effects such as um, combined those reserves will achieve more and greater benefits for conservation or fisheries management than individual isolated reserves would. But to actually achieve those synergistic effects requires that reserve networks have what we term emergent properties. So complementarity in the biodiversity features which they represent within their boundaries and connections between the reserves in a network. And when we assess the sort of existing reserve systems in many parts of the world, we've found that those emergent properties don't generally arise by chance alone. So the recognition that we really need to design reserve networks so that they will have these emergent properties, along with a desire to avoid the residual conservation that Bob was talking about earlier, led to the emergence of systematic conservation planning. And in the past maybe 30 years or so, conservation planners have got really, really good at understanding the principle of complementarity. And that has come to underpin contemporary approaches to designing reserve networks on the land and in the sea. In contrast, whilst it's been acknowledged for a very long time now that we need to consider connectivity in the design of reserve networks, we haven't done nearly so well at understanding how to do that. And there are very few, if any, examples of reserve networks that have actually been informed by connectivity information. So Jeff showed up um, lots of information and graphs of how the last, say, 15, 20 years have seen massive methodological breakthroughs in tracking and modeling larval dispersal um, the decade of connectivity and so on. And the histogram here shows that that same time period saw a massive increase in interest in connectivity in the conservation planning literature. So prior to 1995, there were just two papers in the uh, Web of Knowledge uh, results that sh were, had the keywords conservation planning and connectivity. Uh, from 2006 to 2010, that leapt up to more than 250. And this includes papers which uh, provide general calls for saying we need to consider connectivity, it's really important. And more recently, a few methods that have been proposed for how we might actually do that. But in general, conservation planners are lagging far behind the larval ecologists and theoreticians. There's still conceptual and operational challenges to incorporating connectivity information into the design of reserve networks, and applications to any real-world conservation planning remain rare. So what I want to talk about today is outlining what some of these conceptual and operational challenges are and then touch on some potential ways forward in how we might resolve those. And I'll give a couple of examples, uh, one where we do have all of this connectivity information available and then also thinking about what we might be able to do where we don't have that wealth of information. So the first conceptual challenge to get our head around is that we need to recognize that connectivity is really a means to an end. So I've read loads of conservation plans which have articulated a goal to improve or to maintain connectivity in a system. But really what we're trying to achieve is to improve the likelihood that populations will persist within reserves. So the ultimate goal of conservation planning is not to just represent things within protected areas, but to ensure that they persist there into the future. And from a larval dispersal perspective, there's a couple of different ways where, by which we might achieve persistence. The first being in the, the top figure there on the slide, which is self-persistence. So if there's sufficient local retention of larvae, um, the larvae returning to that site, that, um, that population can replenish itself. The second pathway is what we might call network persistence, where even if no individual site is self-persistent, uh, reserves within a network might exchange sufficient larvae between them so that uh, they can offset those shortfalls in local retention and the population will persist within the network. From a conservation perspective, self-persistence is kind of easy to conceptualize. We know that if we make reserves large enough, and a rule of thumb is that if reserves are twice the size of the mean larval dispersal distance for a species, then it's likely that that species can persist within that reserve. 
But there's a couple of problems with that. Firstly, um, that site might be self-persistent, but what if it's impacted by a disturbance event? It's unclear whether there will be sufficient larvae arriving from other sources to allow that population to recover. And secondly, in many parts of the world, certainly where I work, in the Pacific Islands and the Coral Triangle, it's not possible to establish reserves that are that large. For most coral reef fish species, that would be uh, reserves, say, 20, maybe even 30 kilometers across. So what's great about the concept of network persistence is that it means we might be able to design reserve networks that can improve the likelihood that populations will persist without needing to establish really large fishery closures. So a couple of points to take home from this. Some of this may seem like a lot of common sense, especially to the ecologists out there. But from a conservation perspective, we're not thinking about maximizing connectivity. We need to think about maximizing persistence. And secondly, if we have conservation planning approaches that focus just on the self-persistence pathways rather than considering network persistence, they're unlikely to be adequate to achieve a lot of goals and in a lot of places. The second conceptual challenge is that uh, explicit quantitative objectives are a defining element of systematic conservation planning. So if we're going to try and think about how we can incorporate connectivity into conservation planning, then we really need to set explicit objectives for connectivity. And defining objectives requires three pieces of, inf of information. We firstly need to have a clearly articulated goal, ideally in terms of persistence. Secondly, we need to have some spatial information on a biodiversity feature or process of interest. And then thirdly, we need to have an understanding of the relationship between the amount of that feature or process and our goal in persistence terms. As we've just seen for larval dispersal, uh, spatial data are increasingly available for different species in different locations worldwide. So we no longer have an excuse that there's no data available. These are represented variously as a connectivity matrix in the bottom left-hand side of the slide, or as some of the graph or network analysis um, figures that we saw yesterday in talks from Graham and Michelle and I think a few others. But critically, knowing how these patches are connected to one another, the probabilities or strengths of connections between sites, is different to understanding which patches we should be conserving. So the central problem for conservation planners is given that we can't establish reserves everywhere, which sites should we choose to establish reserves? So attempts to try and solve that problem have focused on using connectivity metrics as a way of quantifying the importance of individual sites. Um, so the value of, in terms of connectivity of an individual site towards that emergent property of connectivity in the whole system. And a lot of these connectivity metrics have been derived from graph theory or network analysis. Um, some of these focus on properties of individual sites, so local retention or larval outflux from a particular site. Others focus on the position of a site within the network, so measures of centrality, such as between the centrality. These are all examples of centrality up here. And these form a really intuitive basis for conservation planning because once we know the connectivity value of each individual site, we can then think about prioritizing on that basis. So we might rank things in order of their connectivity value and reserve those that have the highest connectivity value. Alternatively, we might translate those values into a feature which can be represented. I think Bob made the point earlier that conservation planners are really comfortable by setting representation objectives. So if we can identify highly connected sites and represent those, then that sounds great. But there are a lot of problems with connectivity metrics. So the first being what I'm calling metric uncertainty. So from those network analysis models, we can come up with maybe 40 or 50 different measures of connectivity. And how do we choose between those? Which one should we be using? And we know that that matters because there have been a few papers published which have shown that depending on which metric you prioritize on the basis of, reserve networks look very different. And underlying that uncertainty is that for most of these metrics, there's a really unclear relationship with those persistence goals. So to use the example of between the centrality, which is the middle figure on the slide here, how much between the centrality is enough to ensure that this population persists? That's not something that we can kind of ecologically get our heads around. The third problem is that most of these metrics are static measures of connectivity importance, when in reality the connectivity value of sites is going to be dynamic with respect to the re reservation status of all of the sites within the network. So again, sites may have high between the centrality at the moment because 
they're playing an important role in connecting other sites within the network. But if those sites aren't protected and they become depleted or locally extirpated, then the sites are no longer have high centrality because the sites that they were previously connecting um, are no longer really viable. Um, another problem is that these metrics can't really identify uh, sets of sites with an emergent property. So again, if I look at the, this doesn't really work, um, the central figure up there, between the centrality, you can see that by definition, those sites in red have high between the centrality, so they're not connected to one another. So if we, if we were to establish reserves on each of those red sites, we wouldn't reasonably expect to see any synergistic effects through larval exchange between the reserves in that network. And finally, if we treat connectivity as a feature that can be represented, we're making an unreasonable assumption that we can trade off connectivity across sites. So that a single site with high connectivity value would have equivalent, va equivalent um, conservation value to lots of sites with lower connectivity. So this clearly falls down if you think of a metric of something like local retention of larvae. A site with really high local retention is likely to be one which is self-persistent. If we had several reserves sites with low local retention of larvae, we wouldn't really expect any of those to be self-persistent. So they wouldn't have equivalent connectivity value. So the important thing to take away from this is that connectivity metrics can be really uh, useful in identifying sites that are important for different reasons or that are particularly vulnerable, but that doesn't mean that they form a good basis for conservation prioritization or planning. So going back to thinking about how we define objectives, there's an increasing amount of spatial data available, but our understanding of how those spatial patterns relates to persistence goals remains relatively weak. This has impeded our ability to establish or define explicit objectives for connectivity. And in places where we have been able to define them, they're usually based on sort of arbitrary threshold objectives that are not well informed by ecology. The final conceptual problem is that we need to account for dependencies between sites. So earlier I showed a really simplistic uh, schematic of network persistence where we had two sites exchanging larvae in a single generation that would offset shortfalls in self-recruitment to both sites. In reality, it's likely to be much more complicated. So there's going to be exchange of larvae across multiple sites through multiple generations. So what this means, especially if we think about taking a precautionary approach and if we assume that there's very heavy fishing pressure outside of reserves and so that larval contribution from non-reserve sites is low or negligible, is that whether an individual reserve population is going to persist depends on the reservation status of all of its larval source patches. And whether those source patches persist depends on the reservation status of their source patches. So it becomes this really complex set of site dependencies. What this means for conservation planning is that the potential benefit of applying a conservation action, such as establishing a marine reserve at only one site, can't be considered in isolation of the decisions we make everywhere else within the system. Now this is similar to uh, complementarity and representation objectives, in that the value of an individual site depends on uh, the features that it contains in comparison to features which are represented at other sites within a reserve network. But the critical difference is, is that shortfalls in feature representation can be made up anywhere in the system. So if I'm falling below a representation objective for something like seagrass, I can protect a patch of seagrass anywhere in the system and make up that objective. Whereas for connectivity, those spatial dependencies between sites become paramount. This becomes especially important if a site becomes unavailable for conservation. And we know that most conservation plans are not implemented as they were initially conceived because there's a lot of other factors going on. So on the figure here, for example, if we have that uh, network of sites B, C, and D, if site D becomes unavailable for conservation, say it's a really important fishing ground, we need to find an equivalent site that both contributes larvae to and receives larvae from the same other sites to maintain that closed loop of synergistic effects between the reserves. So this makes it more difficult to think about when we're designing reserve networks, especially in places where things are not implemented in one go. So a lot of places we 
can design a conservation plan, but reserves are uh, implemented sort of over several years following that time. And lots of things change in the meantime. Sites become unavailable for conservation um, or need to be substituted. So in addition to those conceptual challenges, there's a couple of operational challenges that I'd like to highlight. And the first is that um, it's only going to be worthwhile using connectivity information to inform conservation planning if we can see gains in persistence benefits within a reasonable proportion of habitat being protected within reserves. So the data-free graph here shows that on the x-axis, as the percentage of habitat within reserves increases, we're going to see a benefit, a persistence benefit, so an increase in the likelihood that populations will persist within that reserve network. And that relationship can take various different shapes. What we hope is that by using connectivity information, we can increase the slope of that curve uh, within, say, 20 to 30 percent of the habitat within reserves, which is what can be realistically achieved in many places around the world. If that shape of that curve is an S shape and we don't actually see benefits until, say, 40 or 50 percent of the area is in reserves, then we're better off just focusing on increasing the extent of the reserve network without going to the effort of collecting connectivity data and understanding how to apply it. Secondly, I'd just like to quickly emphasize that connectivity is only ever going to be one part of the conservation planning puzzle. And any approaches that we come up with to incorporating connectivity information into conservation planning are going to need to be integrated with lots of other objectives, both for representation of biodiversity features and also for social, economic, and cultural considerations. And whilst it's possible to design, or it may be possible in the near future, to design reserve networks that can guarantee persistence, that generally requires spatially explicit metapopulation modeling, which is not a, a skill which is common among conservation practitioners worldwide. So something that I'm working on at the moment is looking at existing approaches that have been proposed, especially in the recent literature, for how we might think about using connectivity information to inform the design of reserve networks. And these form broadly into five categories, which range from really simple rules of thumb for reserve size and spacing, up to much more complicated methods that use connectivity matrices and infer metrics from those. Without having the time to go through these in detail, what I'd like you to take away from this slide is that if we think about how well each of those do in addressing those three conceptual challenges of understanding a relationship with persistence, defining explicit objectives for connectivity, and accounting for dependencies between sites, none of them can achieve all of those things. Some of them do one or two, but there are usually caveats involved. So we've been limited in our ability to actually use connectivity to inform reserve network design. However, something that I've been really excited about is to be involved in a project that's been undertaken by lots of us at the center. It's being led by Mike Bode, who unfortunately isn't here today. And this is maybe what we can be bold enough to call a gold standard in that we address those three conceptual challenges. We said explicit objectives for persistence and not using proxies for persistence in the form of those connectivity metrics. But we set threshold objectives for the numbers of larvae which needed to arrive in each planning unit within the system. So we know that we're explicitly accounting for those dependencies between sites because those objectives are specified at the patch level. So rather than saying we need a certain amount of larval recruitment within the whole system, we know that larval recruitment to each individual planning unit is going to be sufficient for the population to persist there. And the method that Mike's come up with in explicitly integrates both representation objectives for habitat types in this instance and those objectives for demographic persistence. So there are no inherent trade-offs between those two sets of objectives, which is great. However, we saw in Sean's talk yesterday the sheer amount of information we have for this particular fish in this particular region, so coral trout in the Keppel Islands. The amount of information that was required to be able to parameterize those objectives is just huge. And it's unlikely that this approach is going to be able to be implemented in more than a handful of places worldwide. The other drawback, which is not unique to this particular method, but is that, again, by accounting for those spatial dependencies between sites, we come up with a solution that is a lot less flexible to implementation uncertainty. So what can we do where we don't have all of that information? Can we improve upon existing rules of thumb, which are basically to place reserves within 15 kilometers and closer together if reserves are smaller. 
I tend to think that that is not likely to be a very robust rule of thumb because we're placing reserves within the distance at which they might be potentially connected. The likelihood that they exchange sufficient larvae to offset any shortfalls in self-recruitment is relatively low. So what I think we can do is maybe borrow some ideas from some of the more methodologically complex uh, methods that have been published in the recent literature. This is an example from uh, Marco Andrello's work in the Mediterranean. And what they did is they first split the connectivity metric, uh, matrix to identify highly connected subregions. So these different colored areas are highly connected subregions within which any one site is potentially connected to every other site within that region. So essentially what we're doing is we're focusing our conservation planning region at the same spatial extent as the domain of potential connectivity. And by doing that, we can indirectly account for those dependencies between sites. We can then focus on protecting, say, 20 to 30% of the habitat within each of those regions, and we can be relatively confident that we're going to create a network of reserves that will have synergistic effects between them. Now, this is a lot more stringent a rule of thumb than that existing uh, rule of thumb to place things within 15 kilometers. But in a place where uh, reserves are small and fishing pressure is very high, um, this may be necessary. So to wrap up very quickly, because I'm out of time, a few insights and ways forward. Firstly, there's a lot of approaches for planning for connectivity that seem very intuitive, but on closer inspection, they're flawed. Prioritizing sites on the basis of metrics of network structure, such as between the centrality, can be particularly misguided, unless the conservation problem that we're trying to solve is to add sites to an existing reserve network, in which case it might be quite a good strategy. Methods that can guarantee persistence are likely to be very data intensive and difficult to implement. And the best approach where we don't have that data is to identify internally connected subregions and then focus our planning efforts within each of those in turn. And finally, in places where fishing pressure is really high, we might see better gains in persistence by focusing on better managing fisheries in non-reserve sites so that we maintain some larval contribution from those areas. And I'll finish there, thank you.